Okay, so I think it's time to get started. First of all, thanks everyone for coming here and welcome to one of the very, very best lectures that we have had since I arrived at Ristu Hofstra. My name is Santiago Slavotsky. I am the chair of Jewish Studies here at the university, and I welcome all of you to this excellent lecture we have in front of us. First of all, I want to thank everyone who made possible this lecture, the Cultural Center, especially Athen Collins and Carol Mallison, the History Department, especially the Chair Sari Charnow, the religions, the religion department, especially the chair Julie Byrne, and everyone else who has been is with us today for making this possible. Thank you for making this possible. Today we are going to have a, an excellent talk by a true leading scholar in antisemitism and critical theories of racism. Dr. Jonathan Judaken is the Spencer L. Wilson Chair in Humanities at the Rose College. He has published widely in the history of antisemitism, racism, and especially post Holocaust French Jewish thought. He has written, edited, or co edited six books and over 60 articles. And the last one is the one I will strongly encourage you to go right now online and get it is the Albert Memi Reader that is going to be a landmark in the ways we are reading this exceptional figure we are going to learn about today. The talk is about, the talk today is going to be about the least Tunisian Jewish decolonialist called Albert Memi. And the title of the talk today is going to be Albert Memi, the most important Jewish thinker of the 21th century you might not know about. We will hear now for the next 25 to 30 minutes, we are going to hear a presentation by Dr. Chudaken. And then we are going to have a short conversation between Dr. Charnow, Dr. Chudaken and myself. And then we are going to open for questions. So you might not be able to actually, we might, we might not be uh, uh, lucky enough to hear your voice, but we would love your questions. So I will encourage you throughout the lecture or uh, after the lecture is over to please write in the chat any question you might have, any comment you might have, anything that is clear, anything that you might want more clarification because we have one of the leading scholars, not only in Albert Memi, but also in antisemitism and critical race theory for with us today. And I want all of us to learn as much as we can in the next hour with him. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Chuatan Chudaken to Hofstra, and now we are going to learn from him uh, about his work on Albert Memi. Uh, Santiago, thank you so much for that um, overly generous introduction. Um, I really appreciate the invitation from you and uh, from uh, Dr. Charnow, uh, and uh, very much appreciate all the people who have made this um, possible. I'm going to um, share my screen and um, talk while having you watch a little bit of a PowerPoint. Uh, for those of you who would like, you can um, adjust uh, the viewing and just put a slightly bigger version of my head, presuming that that is what you wanna look at uh, while I go through some of these slides uh, during the time that I speak. I'm, I'm going to start today by telling you a little bit about how I got interested in Albert Memmi, uh, why I love his work, and why you should too. And I'm going to conclude by making the case that if you look back over the last hundred years of his life, <clears throat> that Albert Memmi was one of the most important Jewish intellectuals of the 20th century, um, indeed of the last century, um, and that if this is an occasion in which you might be hearing about him for the first time, uh, that it should become an opportunity for him to enter the pantheon um, and your personal pantheon. I think one takeaway that we might have from this talk is to think a little bit about whether or not you personally have a pantheon of greats uh, who uh, inspire you, prod you, um, stimulate you. For me, that is unquestionably um, part of the role that's played by Albert Memmi. Um, I think I was first introduced to Memmi by uh, Daniel Schrader, uh, who was the Jewish studies faculty member on my uh, dissertation committee. And he's one of the great scholars of North African Jewry, who now teaches at University of Minnesota. And he suggested that I read um, 
Mimi's The Pillar of Salt, which is a fabulous novel that I know many students in the room have read or have read uh, selections from that come out of the, the Albert Mimi uh, reader. And uh, it's a story, as you can see on the cover of the English version, that uh, paints a semi-autobiographical portrait of a young uh, writer coming of age in Tunis uh, in the 1930s and in the era of the Nazi occupation and with the rise of Arab nationalism. Now, since there's an overlap between Mimi's story and the story of the protagonist of uh, the novel, uh, whose name is Alexandre Mordechai Benilouche, his name is important to the identity uh, conflict that he goes through in the course of the novel, let me pause and give you uh, some of the basic facts that defined uh, Mimi's biography and his itinerary. Albert Mimi was born uh, uh, in December uh, 15th, 1920 in Tunis on the borderline between the Jewish and the Arab quarters. He came from a family that was quite poor. His father was a saddler. His mother was an illiterate um, uh, Berber. And Mimi would probably have taken on the croft of his father where he got singled out for his potential in school. His mother tongue was Judeo-Arabic. Uh, the second language that he learned was Hebrew when he went to study in a kutab. Uh, a kutab is like the North African or Mizrahi um, Middle Eastern equivalent of a cheder in which he would have been exposed to a biblical study and uh, to Talmudic study uh, for the first time as a young boy. Um, but at the age of a, a young age, to be uh, precise, at the age of seven, uh, he starts his immersion in French culture at the Alliance Israelite Universelle uh, School. The AIU was an organization that was established in, um, uh, in the aftermath of the Damascus affair in 1860 in order to aid um, imperiled Jews. And one of the things that they did was to set up schools all throughout the Middle East and North Africa with the purpose of engaging in what the French call the mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission by bringing French civilization to their benighted um, brethren. Um, and then uh, Mimi gets a scholarship to attend the best uh, high school uh, in uh, Tunis at the time, the Lycée Carnot. Um, and this is part of the story that he fictionalizes at some length in The Pillar of Salt. He goes on after high school to study philosophy in Algeria, but his life plans are thwarted as a result of World War II especially following the Nazi occupation of Tunisia in November of 1942, which is quite brutal and which he uh, narrates through three chapters at the end of the Pillar of Salt. Memi spends time in a labor camp along with 5,000 other Jews before the liberation in 1943. The Tunisian Jewish community uh, was the first major Jewish community to be liberated from the Nazi occupation um, during the Second World War as the Allies move through North Africa uh, into Europe. Um, following the war, he um, follows uh, two of his mentors to Paris to complete his study. While he's there, he meets his wife Germaine, um, to whom he would end up being married for 70 years. She became a professor of German. She was um, a blonde, uh, um, um, blue-eyed uh, Christian woman from the Northeast of France. So from a very different world than Mimi's. Um, something that he would fictionalize again in his second novel, um, which is translated in, in English as strangers. They settled for a time in Tunisia where uh, Memi gets involved in anti-colonial intellectual circles. 
He helps to start an anti-colonial publication, a publication which still uh, continues today. Today it's called uh, Jeune Afrique. Um, and he would run the literary and, and cultural page. Following Tunisian independence in 1956, he moves permanently to France, believing uh, rightly that the Arab state that was coming into being would have little place for Jews. Um, he does so having already published um, his first two novels and coming back to Paris uh, with the manuscript of the colonizer and the colonized, his famous anti-intellectual tract. So the pillar of salt is really where my exploration of Memi at the suggestion of my um, uh, professor, one of my uh, doctor fathers, um, uh, began. And um, for those of you who are new to Memi, it's really where I suggest your exploration of Memi also begins, because it really is a wonderful window into North African life um, in this era. Um, but also because this is where Memi's career as a writer began, um, and because this novel would help usher in an entire new generation of North American Francophone writers, but also because I think that everything that Memi ultimately would end up exploring in the course of his uh, oeuvre, and I'll talk more about uh, the body of his work, um, is already um, explored in a nascent phase in this uh, literary work. Daniel Schrader um, told me that I should read Mimi while I was just getting going on my dissertation on Jean-Paul Sartre and the Jewish question, uh, which was a rethinking of the work of the famous French intellectualist Sartre from the perspective of his interventions and representations of Jews and Judaism from the 1930s until he died in 1980. And when I went to Israel to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship after completing my dissertation, um, someone suggested that I write a chapter on the reception of Sartre's, um, in English, anti-Semite and Jew, in French, uh, Reflexion sur la question juive, um, Sartre's famous analysis of uh, anti-Semitism. And in that chapter, what I argued was that Sartre's um, text really was the Ur text, the source um, the template around which all discussions of the Jewish question in post-Holocaust uh, French culture um, took place. And um, in that chapter, I included a short section titled Albert Memmi, the Post-Colonial Jew, focusing on Memmi's writings about the Jewish condition which were very much a response um, to Sartre, um, specifically in two of his books that he wrote in the 1960s, the first called Portrait of a Jew and the second called The Liberation of the Jew. And in those first um, pages on Memi that I wrote, I was critical of the fact that Memi was a staunch secularist and that he explained Jewish ritual life like the sociologist and atheist that he was, instead of exploring the beauty and the insight and the transformative possibilities of Judaism as I try to live it. Um, for Memi, and this runs through not only his writing uh, on Jews, but also some of his contemporary reflections on um, uh, on uh, contemporary Muslims uh, living in France uh, who are choosing, for example, to, um, uh, to uh, visibly express their Muslim identity, for example, by wearing headscarves. Um, for Memi, religious ritual life and in particular Jewish ritual life creates community, but it is mostly a compensation for Jewish historical oppression. He will use the same logic 
uh, when it comes to uh, Muslim uh, religious expression today. I then began to learn more about Mimi when the last of my doctoral students uh, at the University of Memphis when I uh, taught there, Michael Lehman, did his dissertation on Mimi. And when Michael finished his doctorate, I asked him if he wanted to work together on the um, Albert Mimi reader. And he agreed to do so. Um, and that's really when I began to <clears throat> delve in a, in a much deeper way through as much of Mimi's um, work as I've been able to, um, uh, to cover. Most of it, but not all of it. Um, we are in a phase in the immediate aftermath of Mimi's death where a number of posthumously uh, published writings of his are coming out, in particular, um, his diaries that he wrote um, through most of his life, uh, the first vo massive volume of which has just been published from <clears throat> the 1930s through the 1960s. Uh, there will be uh, another. So there is a treasure trove of new works of Memi and new angles on Memi um, that are coming out in terms of um, unpublished materials. Um, in addition, the, the reader also includes a number of previously untranslated texts of Memi's that are important um, supplements to uh, some of what's already been published in English. But I really knew that the Albert Memi reader was important for a bigger uh, reason than that. And it's because <clears throat> unlike the great uh, Francophone anti-colonial theorists and post-colonial icons, figures like uh, Franz Fanon, Fanon um, or Amé Césaire who have readers uh, and whose work as a whole is better known, even those who know Mimi's The Colonizer and the Colonized or The Pillar of Salt, for example, um, even though who know Mimi's work tend to only be familiar with really a small slice <clears throat> of his quite extensive oeuvre. And I believe that there is much more to uh, know and to love about Mimi than only some of his better known works. So let me give you an example by giving you the six reasons why I love Albert Memmi in order to persuade you that you should love him too. I love Memmi because given his cultural DNA, he resists easy identity categories and binaries. He makes identity as complicated as I think that it is. Raised on the borderline between the Jewish and Muslim quarters in Tunis, he called himself an Arab Jew or a Jewish Arab. He was at once Tunisian and French, an African and a European. He grew up, priv he grew up poor, but he rose to intellectual heights in France. And many never tired of unsettling and disrupting boxed off identities. Now, to get at this in an even deeper way, what I wanna do is to show you a very short video of Mimi accepting the pomegranate prize presented to him by the Sephardi, um, the American Sephardi Association. Um, this is an interview with Mimi when he is in his 90s just appreciate the magnificence of a mind still churning and still at work. Um, but in particular, pay attention to the ways in which he, he challenges um, the categories of identity. What is it to be Jewish? What is it to be an Arab? What is it to be a uh, Sephardi? In this interview, uh, Mimi is gonna be introduced by Guy Dugas, the leading scholar of Mimi in the world, uh, who situates him in the context of the major writers of the Maghreb or North Africa. So, um, so let me um, share that video with you. Je suis parti. 
parti moi-même en Tunisie à 22 ans avec un sujet de thèse qui portait sur la littérature tunisienne, euh, essentiellement de langue française. Et je me suis vite aperçu que cette littérature tunisienne, euh, c'était essentiellement Albert Mimi, mais qu'il y avait autre chose, une autre dimension que la dimension tunisienne. Euh, et cette dimension, c'était la dimension juive, dont personne ne parlait à l'époque. Même mis en Tunisie, Feraoun, Dib, Mamri en Algérie, Sefrioui euh, et Shraibi au Maroc. Et puis on n'allait pas plus loin que cela. Et moi je me suis rendu compte qu'il y avait une dimension qui était très importante dans son œuvre, supplémentaire, et qu'elle influençait la poétique du texte également. Et que cette dimension, c'était la dimension juive. Cher Albert Nemi, c'est avec un grand plaisir et un grand honneur qu'aujourd'hui, au nom de l'American Sephardi Federation et au nom de, des communautés séfarades du monde entier, que je vous remets la Pomegranate Award, cette récompense grenade, pour l'ensemble de votre œuvre, pour votre engagement humaniste et bien sûr pour votre contribution à la littérature mondiale. Je vous remercie d'être venu d'abord. En même temps, l'atmosphère d'amitié que vous avez amené avec vous. Mais vous savez, vous, vous me posez un problème qui est quasiment insoluble. C'est que, au fond, la littérature, quand c'est pas la filmisterie, c'est une littérature de gare, par exemple, en fait, vous découvre, en faisant une œuvre de littérature, vous découvre que vous ne savez pas. En même temps, vous découvrez des choses et en même temps, on découvre euh, que vous faites quelque chose et vous ne connaissez pas la signification exacte de ce que vous faites vous-même sur vous et sur les gens qui vous entourent. Alors, vous, vous avez voulu aujourd'hui vous demander qu'est-ce que c'est que les séfarades. Au fond, je suis content. Vous avez... Et en même temps, je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. Qu'est-ce que c'était juif Quand j'étais en Tunisie, j'étais encore jeune professeur et j'enseignais au lycée de Tunis. Et pour nous, un juif, c'était les Polonais. Ce pas des, des Arabes. Euh, naturellement, ils n'étaient pas des Arabes. D'ailleurs, qu'est-ce que c'est qu'un Arabe Avec mes amis arabes, je dis aussi, mais vous ne savez pas, vous n'êtes pas un peu plus un homme arabe pour moi. Vous êtes des Kabyles, des Turcs, des Afghans, je sais pas. Qu'est-ce que c'est un arabe bon, Je ne sais pas. Mais il est admis que les Tunisiens, c'est les Arabes. Et la Tunisie, c'est l'Arabie. Eh bien, c'était là. Qui, qui étions nous exactement Il y avait toute une partie qui est arrivée d'Espagne, des Juifs. Connaissaient peut-être, peut-être, davantage le Talmud que les gens de, de Pologne. Oui. Mais parce que. C'était ça leur culture. Quand ils ont commencé à souffrir eux-mêmes à cause du nazisme, à ce moment ils se sont dit, mais qu'est-ce que ces gens Pourquoi ils sont des ennuis Et nous, les séfarades, on a toujours des ennuis. On n'a jamais vécu en, en paix. Maintenant, c'est un tas de notions intellectuelles de la culture mondiale qui m'assaillent. Par exemple, euh, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire, ça L'identité. Bon, euh, euh, certains de mes amis, même Séfarade, nous avons une identité Séfarade. Alors je dis, identité, identité de quoi Qu'est-ce que vous mettez dans cette identité Ils croient qu'ils ont fait une identité culturelle, une identité, et c'est ça la, la communauté juive. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous voulez que je vous dise Je vous remercie de me poser toutes ces questions et d'être venu ici avec vos appareils et votre amitié. Mais je n'ai pas de réponse. Et actuellement aussi, je me dis, qu'est-ce que tu veux comprendre dans tout ça Qu'est-ce que tu veux comprendre Ce que tu peux, au moins, c'est aimer tout le monde. Et j'avoue que là, j'ai un peu une espèce de révolution intérieure de l'histoire, c'est un carnaval. Un carnaval plus ou moins euh, tragique. Parce qu'on on va être 
et puis choisir le meilleur. Et si on demandait aux euh, Français de Tunisie, ceux qui ne sont pas partis, de qui ils sont exactement Ils ne savent pas non plus, vous savez. Personne ne sait exactement qui il est. Alors qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Eh bien écoutez, on va s'aimer. Voilà. So the kinds of intellectuals that speak to me are the kinds of intellectuals who, when they're presented a prize, um, uh, challenge the very terms of the prize itself. Um, here is the most important, uh, arguably the most important Sephardi <clears throat> intellectual um, insisting on problematizing the very meaning of, uh, of, of being Sephardi. And um, I love as well the way in which he ends there talking about um, history as a carnival, um, a more or less tragic carnival. Um, and I feel that uh, um, the prescience of Memi's work continues precisely with this um, sentiment, since after all, isn't that exactly what we're living through right now? A more or less tragic carnival? Um, I love that in the lost years of Memi's life, he was pulled towards this kind of lesson drawing uh, out of his own work. But one of the most important um, lessons that run through, I think, all of Mimi's uh, writing begins with his own cultural DNA um, in the way in which he um, problematizes and questions uh, identities, that they are not stable and monolithic, but are layered and uh, relational. Um, so first of all, I love Mimi because identities were, for him, a problem to explore, not a box to tick. Second, I love uh, Mimi because he was a clearly committed leftist and socialist, but he was also nonetheless critical um, of progressive dogma, critical of the left, even if I think his work all the way through begins from the perspective of challenging the nonsense, the lies, the myths, uh, and the disinformation uh, from the right, engaging in a, uh, a what Marxists would call an ideology critique of the uh, discourse and institutions of the right. Um, and I think Mimi's challenging uh, of the right, but um, also uh, questioning and problematizing the blindnesses on the left. Um, this is true of how he approached the problems, uh, for example, of anti-Semitism and racism, but also colonialism and decolonization. Third, uh, I love Mimi because he was a lifelong Zionist who was nonetheless critical of of uh, Israel's treatment of Arabs and Palestinians and Arab Jews or Mizrahim, Jews from the Middle East. And he was critical of other inequalities in the state of Israel. Edward Said, the famous Palestinian intellectual in his brilliant and uh, blistering article, Zionism from the standpoint of its victims wrote, and I'm quoting Said, Zionism never spoke of itself unambiguously as a Jewish liberation movement, but rather as a Jewish movement for colonial settlement in the Orient. And that is certainly true of the uh, pioneers within the Zionist orbit. But one of the virtues of Mimi Zionism was precisely uh, that he spoke about Zionism as the national liberation struggle of a colonized people. He argued that um, just as the Tunisian Arabs 
were, and Algerians and North Africans were, um, were oppressed and colonized, so too Jews historically have been colonized. And if he argued in favor of independence uh, for Arabs, likewise, he argued um, for uh, an independent um, uh, state of Israel. Um, we can talk more about uh, Memi Zionism, certainly in, in the Q&A. One point that's been raised about his uh, work is whether as a result of his stance on Zionism, he should be considered a model for the left in his understanding that Zionism is the national liberation project of the Jewish people, directly analogous to the anti-colonial struggles of um, other oppressed peoples, or whether he failed to consider deeply enough the ways in which Israel has become a colonial a racist state and that he failed to apply his analysis of privilege uh, in his most famous book, The Colonizer and the Colonized to Israel. This is a topic that I'm interested in exploring more in my own future uh, projects in, in, on Mimin. In fact, uh, next month, I'm uh, supposed to write, uh, give a, a paper at an international conference on Mimi to celebrate the one year anniversary of his uh, passing away in Israel. I, um, I look forward to beginning that project, although with some trepidation, it is um, not an easy topic to tackle, not least uh, in Israel. Fourth, I love Mimi because he was an inventor of concepts who gave us a more refined vocabulary for thinking about all kinds of things, um, including uh, racism or what he would have preferred to call heterophobia. That is uh, the fear or anxiety of the other, a word that he coined along with many other uh, terms. And in the case of heterophobia, he liked that term uh, uh, for talking about uh, racism in part because he was looking for something that was that would allow us to think about racism more uh, capaciously. Um, and for Memi, uh, for example, he thought of Judeophobia, a term that he preferred to anti-Semitism, uh, as, as a form of heterophobia, as is Islamophobia or what Fanon called uh, negrophobia or xenophobia. And he understood that it intersected with homophobia uh, or, or gynophobia. In short, uh, he argued that all racisms are entangled, that all forms of oppression are entangled. And if we care about combating one of them, Judeophobia, for example, um, or negrophobia, for example, we can only do so in an anti-racist coalition that struggles against all of them. Many also coined the wonderful French neologism, uh, judaïté. Now, this is a word that could be translated into English as Jewishness, um, but that little uh, itty suffix, um, whether in French or in English, means being. And what Mami explored in his writings about Jews was what being Jewish means existentially, asking Jews to think about what the meaning of their being Jewish is. He explored the meaning of the Jewish condition and what was different about it, um, <clears throat> about being Jewish, from our navigating the human condition more generally. And it's, it's, it's these existentialist and ontological um, elements within his analysis that make a word like judaïté much more powerful than the ways in which it might be translated uh, into uh, Jewishness. So I love that Memi was an inventor of concepts. Uh, fifth, and this is to elaborate on the point that I made above about heterophobia. I love Memi because I probably learned more from him about how I think about racism 
than from anyone else. Many, uh, as I said, clearly understood that all racisms are entangled. He wrote so eloquently and so insightfully about um, not only the colonized and Jews, but about African-Americans. He dedicated the colonizer and the colonized in its English translation to American blacks. Uh, he wrote wonderful essays on um, uh, Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King and in particular on Baldwin. I was just teaching um, the fire next time today to my students. What a magnificent text. Uh, Memi would write the preface uh, to that uh, text. Um, and he wrote about uh, these figures along with the experience of uh, post-colonial immigrants in a wonderful short essay called The New Slaves, uh, uh, alongside the struggles of women and the poor. Again, ultimately insisting that we have to understand how all oppressions are linked or uh, intersect long before intersectionality became a common way of understanding racism. And last, I love Mimi because he's just a phenomenal writer. Um, beyond the Pillar of Salt, he published five other novels and works of poetry. Indeed, he helped to create the field of Francophone literature in particular from uh, North Africa and from the Maghreb. And as my colleague Leah Brosgill has argued in her important book against autobiography, he was also an important theorist of literature, uh, of world literature, as well as a novelist. Um, but Mimi's writing in general, all of it, is remarkably um, insightful because of his craft as a writer, because the way in which as a writer, he translated his sociological and philosophical essays, um, making his writing easy to understand, but also textured and layered, um, full of depth. So having given you these six reasons and having just co-edited co this compendium of um, Albert Memmi's writing, which attempts to distill the library of a great writer into the cover of a single book. I'm always a little bit surprised uh, when I mention that, you know, um, uh, this book has just come out on Memmi or I talk about Almer Memmi, Albert Memmi. Um, how many people have never heard of his name before? Um, he was, after all, uh, one of the most important uh, Jewish thinkers of the 20th century. As I've said, arguably the most important Jewish Sephardi Jewish intellectual full stop. And he belongs in the pantheon alongside Freud and Einstein, along with Hannah Arendt and Jacques Derrida, with Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi and all the other titans of the 20th century, born in December 1920 and passing from us last year, we are now in the midst of the centenary of his life. And it seems to me a good time to place him into the cultural pantheon where he belongs. Jew and Arab, Tunisian and French, African and European, a socialist, a humanist, an anti-racist, a poet and a novelist, Mimi could also channel the biblical prophets. There are two visions of humanity and two philosophies he wrote in his Summa Racism. This encompasses the fundamental moral dis discussion of love or hate of the other, of justice or injustice, equality or oppression, for ultimately, the essence of morality is respect for the other. Many not only echoed this message that we have learned perhaps even more emphatically from his confrere, Emmanuel Levinas, another one of the great um, post-Holocaust 
uh, Jewish thinkers. But Mimi taught us that we must also respect and honor the others within. For like Mimi, we are all multi-layered. We are all exiled. We are all primed to want to dominate others, but must be taught to love difference. We are all vulnerable and anxious, which is the source of why we often define ourselves against others. We are all dependent beings in search of our humanity. And marinating in Mimi's writing brings us in touch with this. This is why I love Albert Mimi. This is why Albert Mimi deserves to be in our pantheon of greats. And this is why we need Albert Mimi now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Chudakin.